What's going on everybody? Congratulations for passing P1, you're on to P2. So that's a big deal, you pass your first check ride. However, if you are watching this video and you haven't watched my other videos and you're a flight school student on hold or somebody just interested in flight school, please go back and watch my other videos to inform yourself so you know what's going on uh, in, in the flight school series. Um, this is um, one video of several videos that make up this entire series. So let's talk about P2. So in P2, you're going to be graded on every single thing you were graded on in P1. You're going to be expected to retain uh, proficiency on those P1 uh, check ride items and you're going to be expected to perform them at standard every single day. Um, and on your P2 check ride by the end of P2, you'll be expected to do the auto rotation, the run on landing, the steep approach to the surface landing, and uh, the slope landing, along with a level acceleration takeoff and a vertical takeoff on top of uh, the normal takeoff, what you already did in P1. So those are all of the new items that you'll be expected to do and gain proficiency on and do to standard at the end of P2. Um, hours and duration that make up P2. So in P2, you will gain another 15.7 aircraft hours. That's 15.7 just in P2. And then um, there's no sim time in P2. So that's 15.7 on top of what you already have from P1. Um, and then your EPs and limits exam will happen also in P2. Uh, so hopefully you've been studying uh, those EPs and limits all throughout P1 because at some point in P2 you're going to be expected to take them. For my class, I think it was like the week before our P2 check ride we were expected to take them. Don't quote me on that. I mean, P2 for me was, was a while ago, but it definitely happens in P2 and you're expected to get at least a 90 on the exam. If you don't receive a 90 on the exam, you will have to retest uh, the very next day. And if you don't pass, or not just pass, but get a 90 on that retake, then uh, you will probably be recycled back to the next class if you're lucky, maybe several classes after that. Um, so pass that EP and limits exam. Uh, also, in academics, remember, uh, in flight line, you're also, you're dual hat, you're flying every day and you're also going to academics and doing classroom stuff every single day. So big test that's happening in P2 is your uh, VFR navigation exam. Um, of course, this was, so just keep in mind, this is how it was whenever I went through. We had the VFR uh, navigation exam during P2. Uh, so in that exam, you're going to be expected to know all of the classes of airspace, and you're going to be expected to be able to look at a VFR sectional and pick out those uh, classes of airspace and know all of the VFR flight rules um, in that exam. So I'll give you an example of the problems you might hear. So it'll be like, you're flying out of Cairns Army Airfield and you're going on a VFR flight plan to Mariana. You're flying in X location at X altitude. What class of airspace are you currently in right now? So those are examples that uh, of, of questions that will be fairly common on that exam. Also on that exam as well, uh, you have the E6B. Uh, everybody loves this portion of the exam. Obviously, I'm, I'm being sarcastic about that comment, um, but the E6B. You'll be expected to do several conversions using your E6B. For those of you who don't know what an E6B is, this is what it looks like. Um, this little tool right here can solve literally anything. It's 
It's like black magic. It literally can solve everything. Uh, I actually helped my wife do some of her nursing school uh, pharmacy conversions on it. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty cool whenever you you actually understand how to use this. Um, and then in, in the beginning of flight school, obviously, it's very confusing and intimidating, but you do learn how to use it in this section. Um, so one thing I use this for literally every single day uh, on flight line was for my fuel calculations. Um, I eventually moved on to an app on my iPad that do, that do my fuel calculations for me, but in the very beginning, I was so scared uh, and intimidated by my IP that if I was doing it on an app, he was going to get mad and unsat me for the day, but um, they normally don't care about that. Uh, you're just over paranoid in the beginning. So I did my fuel calculations every single day on my E6B. Uh, you're going to be expected to master that on this exam, and you're going to be doing all kind of conversions like time distance uh, conversion, wind correction, speed conversions, uh, weight conversions, uh, all of that stuff. So that will be on this exam. Uh, I studied really hard for this exam because, again, this is like I'm pretty sure the second exam that you take. And I don't know, I'm just, when I took this exam, I was still in that just new, new guy kind of, oh, I gotta, I gotta really do well on this exam. Like, this is important. I was, you know, so scared of doing bad because I was extremely happy to be here and I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize that. So I studied really hard for this exam. Um, and a little bit about that. So in the academic portions of flight school, they have these things called um, the student handouts. Uh, the student handouts are great because they literally are basically very thorough notes that instructors type up themselves on things they feel relevant uh, that students should know. And then on top of that, in each section of the student handout, they have practice questions. And if you do those practice questions and you can get so good at doing them uh, without any help or getting them wrong, you're likely going to do really good on the exam. Now, they're not the same questions you're going to see on the exam, but they're, they're, um, if you could solve those questions, you should be able to solve the, the questions on the exam. And the student handouts do a really good job of also uh, giving you very thorough notes to study. So at this point, I hadn't really discovered that. I was still in that stage of like, oh, I need to study everything. And uh, I was kind of doing overkill. Um, and then later on, as I moved through to other phases, I was like, no, I'm just going to prioritize uh, the student handouts and... Uh, I'll study maybe some PowerPoint stuff and call it a day. Um, and I still did really well on the exams. But uh, yeah, the student, my, my point is the student handouts are extremely helpful. Um, so that covers the exam. Um, now I'm going to go into talking about my story in P2. So P2 was a lot easier for me than P1. Um, at this point, I started to get a little more comfortable. Now, that's not to say that P2 was easy for me. Um, I, w I still had a lot of learning to do. Um, but I was slowly getting my touch and my control uh, of the aircraft. Uh, starting to learn a lot. Um, but I was growing more confident and uh, things weren't, uh, I wasn't in like a panic state all the time of just being terrified that I was never going to learn how to fly. Um, I, I, was, I was on a good, good pace in P2. Uh, again, still challenging, but I felt pretty comfortable, uh, especially towards the end of P2. Um, now, something really helpful for me in P2 was actually reading the, not only the ATM standards, but actually going through and reading the entire procedures, especially for the run on landing and the auto rotation. And it literally says, 
like for the run on landing. It says on your approach, how fast you should be, what your feet per minute rate of descent should be. And I remember like it was yesterday coming in on my approach after reading that the night before. And I was like, okay, I'm at or below 40 knots, uh, ground speed. Um, I'm, I have less than 300 feet per minute rate of descent right now. This should be a good run on landing. And literally walking through those procedures, and please forgive me, it's been a while since I've done a run on landing. I, I fly Blackhawks, now I do roll-ons, and the, although the fundamentals are, are very similar, the, uh, the speeds and the rate of closure and the rate of descent we, is different. So just forgive me on that in the comments. But yeah, my point is, Read the ATM, not only the ATM standards, you should always be reading the ATM standards, but actually the procedures and repeat them to yourself. Put them on flashcards, test yourself on them, and then when you're doing the run on landing or the auto rotation, repeat them in your head, repeat them in your head. Um, that really helped me out, especially for the run on landing. The auto rotation, um, I just went with RAT. Uh, RAT, which was uh, ensuring my rotor with, was within limits, my airspeed was within limits of what you're trying to get in the Lakota. If I can recall correctly, I think you're trying to, the sweet spot I think is 80. Um, maintaining that and obviously aircraft and trim. And then you're looking for, I believe it's 200 feet um, AGL before you flare. Um, and then pull in power. So you're just repeating that type of stuff over and over and over uh, in your head um, as you're doing it. And you know it like clockwork. That way when you get on the P2 uh, check right, if you can say th these things to yourself in your head, you're not reactionary. You're what they call ahead of the aircraft. You're, you're flying that aircraft so well that you're ahead of it. You're, you're predicting what's going to happen. Um, also in P2... My my touch with the controls, control touch was much better. It was coming along. It wasn't where it it needed to be, but it was on course to. Um, and when I say needed to be, I mean like as a really good aviator. I was still learning, but it was it was on course, and I was making a lot of progress with my control touch. In P one, it's very you're very stiff, and and everything is like this, and then. P2, you start to slowly relax a little bit, and it's not so much movements, it's more pressure. Teeny tiny micro movements in the collective and on the cyclic. Very teeny tiny micro movements get the job done in rotary wing flight. Um, and you, you start to develop that uh, well in P2, or at least that was my story. Um, was I perfect? Hell no. I wasn't perfect. I'm still not perfect, but I was well on my way of getting there. Um, now, let's talk about the EP and limits exam. So I mentioned that previously in the video. We're going to talk about it a little more right now. So EP and limits exam. So whenever I was in your shoes, I remember thinking, oh, I need to know all the EPs and all the limits for the Lakota. Um, you do need to know all the limits, but not necessarily all the EPs. Uh, you need to know something called the Big Seven. Now, the Big Seven, uh, I actually have them right here. Give me a minute, I'll pull it out. Now, the Big Seven... I have a document like this, and knowing Fort Rucker, this is probably still going to be circulating when you go through. Um, you have single engine, failure in flight. You have single engine, failure, OGE. Single engine, failure, OGE, landing. Engine overspeed, gov fell. Auto rotation. Uh, tail rotor drive failure, fixed pitch, forward flight, engine underspeed, gov failure, and that's the big seven. Also, big seven plus fire. So, and I would know fire in flight and fire on ground. But this is the big seven when you hear the term big seven. So, 
single engine failure and i'll just go through this doc i'm not going to go through the whole entire thing but i just want to show you guys this document so if you notice this is an acronym document this breaks the eps down in acronyms acronyms in flight school it's just like med school everything is acronyms to make you you you're re trying to retain so much knowledge you have to learn this way um and then eventually it just becomes second nature. So I got this document and I was like, none of the none of these acronyms are gonna stick with me because they don't make sense. CAC rack asshole. That doesn't make sense. Now I made it made sense because what I did was I took the dots and I adjusted them. So for this one. I remember I took the dot and I moved it over between the C and the A and I made it C A crack and then A S L. And then I literally made this document on my laptop. I don't have it anymore, the document, but I would put I would associate pictures with it. So for this one that I just showed you, for the C A, that's the abbreviation for California. So I put the California flag right next to it. So I'd remember that. And then for crack. I, you guys may think this is funny, but that's, I try to make my acronyms funny to, to, to remember them more, but I put a crack pipe for California crack, crack pipe, picture of a crack pipe, and then assault, and I put an air assault badge right next to uh, ASL. So when I saw single engine failure OGE, my acronym was California crack assault. And that made sense to me because I, I, California had a crack epidemic back in the 80s and the SWAT teams assaulted houses. So it made sense. And then I, remem I memorized these acronyms and I was able to know them better. And then after you memorize the acronyms, you then have to actually learn the EPs associated with them. Once I did that, and I did that to every single one of them, J the story about the California crack assault, I did that similar thing, and I'll, that wasn't even funny compared to some of the other ones I came up with. But um, I remember this one I made. I used a picture of a Apache helicopter and then a picture of a big a guy with a big um, cavalry cowboy hat on for the Apache pilot and the Apache was broken down in the middle of the desert and he needed to call AAA. So CAS for close air support, Sal, the pilot's name, and then call AAA because the Apaches always break, break down. Everyone knows that. Um, but just cool things like that. And you'll, you'll pick these up quick and you'll remember them very well and they'll stick with you forever. Um, so that's my spiel on the EP uh, portion of the exam. Another thing, I almost forgot to tell you guys this. My IP and other IPs will also unsat you in P2 if you don't know the EP. So EPs and limits are free game in P2. Um, I'm not sure what training day it will be on, but um, they can and they will unsat you if they say, hey, single engine uh, single engine failure, what is it? And you're like, uh, uh, I don't know. They'll be like, okay, unsat for the day. You could have done every single thing else perfectly, but you don't know your EPs. They, It's free game. They can unsat you. Um, and then limits. So for limits, look up on YouTube, look up the major system. So the major system is a memory strategy used by... Um, a lot of doctors, a lot of lawyers, a lot of uh, engineers, any profession that has a lot of memory uh, stuff associated with it, a lot of people uh, use something called the major system. I YouTube this and I watched a great video. I'll drop it in the link below. And it, it talks about how to use the major system. But I don't want to get into to all of that because it's pretty complex. It's easy to pick up, but it, it would be too much to get into on this video. And there's already a good one that exists that breaks it down. But in P2, you're expected to know this FLI chart. It looks just like this. And if you've already passed your P1, 
check ride, you already know and you're already getting familiar with this top chart. You're expected to memorize all of that. Myself and all of my classmates struggled to, to understand because where I'm currently at and as a pilot right now, I, I can comprehend what this FLI chart means. But when you're in P2, everything is memorize, 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 memorize. Nothing really totally makes sense at this point. You're just, unless you have an engineering background or you have a, a, an aviation background, none of this is making sense to you right now. It's rote memorization. That's what you're doing right now at this point. Later on in the course, everything is going to start coming together. And the IPs know this. Uh, but they want to see you still memorize all of this. So use the ma major system for uh, the FLI chart. Uh, the other stuff, it's possible to memorize without that, but acronyms for EP and then uh, encode the FLI chart with the major system. And I'll, uh, again, I'll drop that link below. Um, so I want to talk about what my P2 check ride was like. Um, P2 check ride, honestly, it was pretty uh pretty easy. I think I got a a, a very fair IP. Um I remember expecting to go in there and just get destroyed on the limits and EPs and stuff like that. And uh I remember sitting down, introducing ourselves, and we didn't do any table talk. He was like, hey, you guys ready to go fly? And we're like, hell yeah, let's go fly. So we went out and we went and flew. And for a second there, I remember me and my stick buddy were kind of smiling at each other like, hey, dude, we might get out of doing table talk, man. Um, Went out to the stage field, did pre-flight, uh, went out, did the stage field. Oh, again, uh, on pre-flight they're still going to probably walk around and ask you what this component is. Um, went out, went out to the stage field. Um, the flight itself was pretty standard. Um, nothing was really incredible, but nothing was terrible. It was a pretty, it was a solid check ride. What you, what you really want, honestly. Um, and we came back in and then uh, he was like, all right, let's do AAR at the table. And then, of course, out comes the sectional, out comes the FLI chart, and then table talk starts. And uh, honestly, he was still pretty chill. N no crazy questions or anything like that. Uh, asked us a couple EPs and uh, did some sectional stuff. Honestly, uh, really cool IP. Um, but yeah. Good luck on your P2 check ride, and the next video we're going to talk about BI and AI. So uh, stay tuned, fellas, and uh, keep flying, keep studying, and working hard. I'll see you on the next one.